B, session number 43 of New Testament survey. We are in the um, second chapter of the book of Colossians. Uh, this little book of Colossians, you recall, was written by Paul from prison to a group uh, whom he had not met with yet. The church was planted by disciples of Paul at Ephesus. Uh, this is also true with the church at Laodicea, which is just the other side of the river. Uh, there's, there's a fairly steep valley, and Colossae is on one side overlooking the valley, and Laodicea is only a few kilometers away. They're, they're uh, close neighbors. Uh, and so Laodicea is uh, going to be one of the churches that John writes to in the book of Revelation. Uh, and very likely the, the same situation applied to the church in Colossae. Uh, Colossae, as, as you recall from last time, was struggling with a heresy. Uh, it's a unique thing, uh, the, the mixture of bad ideas is unique to Colossae. Uh, we find a, a lot of these bad ideas elsewhere in other religions and other backgrounds, even, even in other um, Christian heresies. Um, but this is the only place that we find this particular mix. Uh, so we've got uh, legalism, uh, perhaps affected by the Jews. We've got the worship of angels. Uh, we've got a, a devotion to elementary principles of the world, which is probably a philosophical thing. Uh, there's a bunch going on. Uh, the belief in uh, revealed mysteries and elite knowledge. There's, there's a lot of stuff going on, and it's hard to know exactly what it is. Maybe there are competing false teachers. But Paul is dealing with that from a distance. <laughs> he did it without Zoom. How, how did he manage? <laughs> I, I can't imagine how, how Paul managed to successfully deal with anything without a computer. Uh, nevertheless, uh, we got done with chapter one. Uh, I'm going to start the, uh, the screen here. Let's see if we're ready to go. Uh-oh. And I have, I have lost it. So I'm going to end up having to kill it. There it is. Yep. This is what's coming. No, it's coming out. Okay. This is good. And get that over there so that all of my stuff is where it is supposed to be. Beginning at verse one of chapter two, what Paul is doing here is a, a continuing this long introduction. He's uh, 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 saying, dear Colossians, uh, I'm praying for you. And this is what I'm praying for you. Uh, and along the way, uh, Paul is laying out one of the, the strongest uh, Christological uh, passages in the New Testament. Uh, as I mentioned before, the Gospel of John the book of Hebrews are, are the two huge Christological uh, passages in the New Testament, but it is heavily uh, influenced uh, by Paul in uh, the book of Colossians. Uh, Paul's work here is uh, amazing for the provision of the language, the vocabulary that we use to talk about the person and work of Christ. Uh, he's the guy. So as we get into chapter two, Paul is uh, praying for uh, the people in Colossae uh, that they might be uh, built up. Uh, so let's look at uh, beginning at verse one, chapter two. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face. So he's, he's saying essentially, I, I would sure love to see you guys, uh, but I can't 
for whatever reason. Uh, and there are, you know, being in prison has a way of dampening your travel outlook. Uh, but he says, I'm praying for you. Uh, you know, and I'm struggling for you. And I, it, I, I would really like to uh, see some things happen that your hearts may be encouraged being knit together in love to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Okay, Paul is using a, a lot of important language here uh, that is speaking about what we ought to be after in Christian education. Uh, what are we really going for as, as Christians grow up and as they develop in their knowledge of Christ, what do they really need? And Paul says, uh, I'm, I'm praying for you that, uh, that your hearts may be encouraged uh, encouragement, as we mentioned before, is uh, exhortation or um, coming alongside to be of assistance. The, the Greek word is parakalo. Uh, and uh, it's like the Holy Spirit is coming alongside your heart to be an encouragement. It's, it's kind of a neat image. Being knit together in love. Uh, the, the together there refers to the whole body of the Colossian and Laodicean people, the whole community. Uh, something that I think is um, uh, worth emphasizing again and again and again uh, is that uh, Christianity is best when practiced in community. We have to have church. We have to see one another. We have to get to know one another. We have to practice loving one another uh, and learn how to do what is best for one another. That's, that can only be done when we are operating in community. Uh, one of the great tragedies of this whole uh, COVID lockdown experience for the whole world has been the difficulty of doing church. Non-Christians think that church is some ritual, some meaningless uh, repetitions of prayers and stuff that can be easily done uh, on your own or uh, watching TV or something like that, but they're really wrong. Uh, we really need one another and we need to learn how to love one another. That's, that's at the core. Uh, and the encouragement that we receive in Christ is uh, experienced within the body of Christ, uh, the church. Uh, so we desperately need the church. Uh, this is why I'm, you know, I'm so happy that we have uh, an online alternative. We, we can do this. Uh, I don't believe this is as good, but, the, but we can do this. That their hearts may be encouraged being knit together in love with the goal to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery which is Christ. Okay, we, we need to unpack that because look at what Paul is doing here. He's, uh, uh, he, he's building a series of, uh, oh gosh, what's a simple way to say it? Uh, the of clauses here are, are what we call genitives uh, or in the Old Testament, we call this a construct chain. Uh, and it's one thing on top of another, on top of another, on top of another, to reach all of the riches. Well, which particular riches are we talking about? Of assurance, of full assurance. The, 
the term full assurance means a, a mature or complete or perfect assurance. Assurance is the uh, the certainty that the principles that we believe are true. Uh, and how do you get there? Well, by studying together and sharpening one another through dialogue and conversation and study. Uh, and then by actually doing the truth in the environment of the community. That's, that's, how it, that's how it works. So we're reaching out for all the riches, the, this, this full treasure house of full assurance of understanding and knowledge. Understanding and knowledge are, are, are very similar ideas, but they're, they're somewhat different. Uh, knowledge uh, is the comprehension of a set of facts. Uh, so you've got a, a, a list of things that are true. Understanding is the insight to see how all of those facts fit together into larger truths. Uh, and uh, it, it's what I call connecting the dots. Uh, when you were a kid, you probably did those puzzles where there were dots all over the page and you went from dot number one to dot number two to dot number three, and, and it turned out to be something, a, a duck or a truck or whatever it was. Um, in the Bible uh, and in history and in current affairs and in the life of the church, we need to learn to connect the dots to understand how everything works together in God's plan and in God's mind and in God's understanding. Uh, because truly, all things are in God's plan. And it's all working out. He's got a, he's got a blueprint. Uh, he's working his plan. Uh, and uh, those of us who are a part of that usually only see our own little part of the battlefield, but there's a whole big plan going on uh, that uh, we can understand as we study. To, so to reach the, uh, uh, all, all of the riches of full assurance, of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ. Okay, God's mystery there. Mystery is a key word because the Colossians were being told that uh, uh, if they kept their noses clean and worked real hard at this stuff, they would be introduced to the mysteries of some Greek philosophy or another. We're going to show you the mysteries. Uh, these were called mystery religions. Uh, there's quite a wide variety of them. Uh, some of them involved sacrifices, some of them involved asceticism, some of them involved angels, some of them involved stuff that we don't know anything about. We call these the mystery religions, and they were a, a major competitor for Christianity in the early church. And, uh, Paul is saying to the Colossians, uh, there's only one mystery that you really need to worry about, and that's the mystery of God, which is Christ. And here in the church, you have the tools that are necessary to enjoy all the riches of the full assurance of understanding of the knowledge of God's mystery. This is Christ in whom are hidden all of the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So this treasury of wisdom and knowledge, uh, and again, wisdom and knowledge are related terms. Knowledge is the, the com collection of facts. Wisdom is the, the practical understanding of what these facts actually mean. It's a little different from understanding. Understanding is where you, you can see how it all fits together. Wisdom has to do with using the facts to be able to look at life from God's point of view. 
so that you can make decisions that actually make good sense. And all of these are related. Knowledge and understanding and wisdom build on one another. And all of them, the wisdom and knowledge and understanding are found together in Christ because all of the treasuries of this are found in Christ. And as we walk with Christ and study the scriptures and live in community with one another, sharpening one another, uh, we, we build that wisdom together. That, that's the purpose of Christian education. Uh, so on, uh, on a Sunday when we get together, it's not just about the preaching. It's not just about the singing. Uh, it, it's about our interaction with one another. Uh, the, uh, uh, the wisdom and the knowledge that the Colossians were seeking uh, in all of the wrong places is actually found in Christ. They never needed the uh, Greek philosophical or Gnostic mysteries. Those things are actually false. They're not even close to right. Um, let's go on just a few verses. Let's see if I can find my cursor here. Go down. Oh, do, 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 do. Uh, yeah, I better read verses four and five while, while we're in uh, this passage. I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. A plausible argument is an argument that is false, but sounds good. A lot of people come to us with arguments that uh, actually don't sound all that bad. I mean, it makes a certain amount of sense. Uh, but they're uh, they're wrong. They're damaging. They're designed to enslave us, uh, and uh, we we ought to check everything out uh, with the principles of Scripture. That's the beginning point. Uh, it says I I say this that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. For though I am absent in body, yet I am present with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. He's trying to build them up a little bit. He goes on into verse, verse six. Therefore, so he's coming into a conclusion here. As you received Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. Now, look at, look at all of this. You received Christ Jesus the Lord, and as a result of that, you are rooted and built up and established in the faith, just as you were taught. There's three things going on there. As um, uh, Paul is talking about what happens to the, uh, to the new Christian, okay? you received Christ Jesus the Lord. Great. That's wonderful. You've, uh, you've accomplished step number one. You're, you're at the zero point, which is much better than the minus 20 point. You're, you're, uh, you're making progress in the right direction, and you're all the way up to the beginning. This is wonderful. And at this point, you are rooted. Uh, the, the believer's roots are to be put down like a tree into the, into the nourishment of the word of God. There's, there's nothing more important for the believer, young or old, than to spend time in the scriptures. There's nothing more important. Uh, and any way we can do that is good. Now, people ask me, what version of the Bible should I have? And the answer is, whichever one you will read. Uh, and I honestly don't care uh, if if it works best for you in Italian or in Tagalog. That's wonderful. I, it it doesn't matter. Uh, uh, all of the Bibles, no matter how badly translated they are, uh, will do a great deal of good. Uh, and so I have I have very little patience for people who say everybody ought to read one particular version of the Bible. Eh. Read the Bible that you enjoy uh, and, uh, and read it regularly. 
uh, 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 spend time with it, mark it up and study it and chew on it. That's where the rooting uh, comes from. The building up uh, is the growth that happens when our roots go deep. When the roots are deep into the word of God, the spirit of God has material to work with as we interact with the world. Again, it's like a tree. The part that's up above the ground is the part that looks like it's growing. But of course, the, the roots are growing all at the same time. That's invisible. But the visible part that's visible to the world, that's up in the air and in the community, is being built up in him. In other words, this, this visible part of me ought to be looking more like Christ all the time. I should be coming more like Jesus. That's the point of Christian education. That's, that's what we're after. So we establish the roots. And the building up is going, it's handling it, things correctly in the, the larger world and established in the faith. Uh, the, the idea there is that with good roots and real growth, you become a part of the, of the superstructure of the church, this building, this temple, which is the body of Christ. Uh, you become a, a, a contributing part of the whole church, uh, not not just somebody who uh, who sucks the life out of the church, but who is actively participating in the life of the church, rooted, built up, and established, just as you were taught, abounding in uh, thanksgiving. So, therefore, just as you receive the Lord, so walk in him. Keep on keeping on. Um, often we Christians uh, would prefer that, uh, that God handle problems in our lives by doing great big miracles. And most of the time, God doesn't operate through miracles. He doesn't do large, spectacular events to transform the world that we're in and get rid of all the problems. Instead, he wants us Christians to, to grow slowly against the resistance of the world around us uh, and to continue walking. Now, sometimes Paul talks about running, but more often he talks about walking in Christ, one step at a time one bit at a time, steadily, consistently, keeping on, and then having kept on, keep on keeping on. Uh, the, the routine of the Christian life is probably more important than the big spectacular growth spurts. Uh, and uh, Paul talks about this Christian education is just a continuing thing. We're just stay with it. Now, Paul is going to go on into a polemic in uh, verses 8 through 23. Uh, Paul is going to begin attacking uh, the Greek philosophical problems that uh, he says is uh, going on in uh, Colossae. Uh, and he actually doesn't give us enough to make it completely sure where he's going, but I think there's enough here that we've, we've got some ideas and it, it's close enough. The important thing that Paul is doing in this passage is comparing Christ with the man-made philosophical and religious systems that are on offer uh, there in uh, Colossae. So he's gonna launch in at verse eight and uh, we'll, we'll look at that uh, at eight. Yeah, da, da, da. see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit. I probably should have included that one in the slide. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy 
and empty deceit. Uh, philosophy is the uh, is the whole arena of, of Greek thought. Uh, the uh, uh, the Greeks invented real philosophy, uh, complete with um, you know arguments for the for the nature of truth and uh, the the rules of logic. Uh, formal logic uh, has a uh, a mathematical foundation to it. There's a uh, there there's a beauty to an understanding of real uh, logic at the philosophical level. And that's not a wrong thing. That's actually a really good thing. The Greeks uh, contributed enormously to the, uh, uh, to the uh, uh, development of thinking. Uh, so it isn't, it isn't wrong, but, um, there are some ways of misunderstanding philosophy that, uh, that do get us into some serious trouble. So philosophy and empty deceit. Uh, deceitful is deceptive. Uh, liars are deceitful. And it is entirely possible to use philosophy to support a lie. It's a misuse of philosophy but it can be done. Okay, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world and not according to Christ. Elemental spirits of the world is a phrase that we find only in Paul. Uh, he's using this to refer to the uh, the, the notions, the assumed beginning points uh, of the, uh, the philosophers. Uh, he says, instead, uh, in him, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. And you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. Verse nine is the key to the, uh, to the whole argument. Uh, he's saying, he's attacking here the basic problem in uh, the philosophical movement that a hundred years after Paul, we're going to know as Gnosticism. It has its roots in Greek philosophy. Uh, and the, the problem is right here in verse nine. In him, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. In Greek philosophy, the idea of a God with a body is impossible. Now I know the old pagans visualize their gods with bodies, but by the time we get to Plato, the idea of God becomes a purely spiritual notion. And the idea of a body becomes a purely material notion. I'm going to show you a diagram here that I hope is somewhat helpful. Uh, Plato, around 500 BC. So half a millennium before the time of Christ. Uh, Plato, uh, taught that, um, and actually Aristotle after him would agree with this, and all of us actually ought to agree with Plato on some parts of this. Uh, Plato taught a kind of dualism, uh, that there is an upper story that is spiritual, non-material, and composed of ideas. Uh, or sometimes called ideals. An idea is a universal truth that has no physical form at all. It exists as a, uh, as a proposition in the mind of Plato would say, the one. Plato taught that there is one prime mover in the world, uh, that the world is in motion because 
someone, some thinking, planning, powerful entity began the motion. And he used the term, the prime mover, the first mover. And that first mover is necessarily eternal, therefore must be spiritual, must be perfectly true in everything that he knows, and must be good. Uh, all of that is correct. <laughs> Plato uh, uh, pretty much lays down uh, the, the fundamental arguments for the existence of God, uh, but he never quite makes the connection. Uh, it will be very interesting to find out, you know, how Plato turned out uh, later. I, I have often wondered if he'll be in heaven. Uh, I suspect not, but uh, it, it would be fun if he was, because it would make for some good conversations. The lower story is the material world. Uh, Plato said the the true ideas exist in the in the mind of God, and they they are like lights that cast shadows into the cave of the material world. And so you see shadows on the wall projected into the cave. Uh, and those shadows are not real. They're material things. They're, um, they're secondary things. Uh, and by extension, they are evil, not good, because God is good but the material world is evil. Now, later on, this dualistic idea, which is actually kind of true and actually ends up being very helpful when we add Aristotle's ideas, uh, launches a movement called Gnosticism. Uh, Gnosticism is the idea that if the spiritual world is good, and the material world is evil, the spiritual world must be uh, the source of the material world, but it can't be a direct contact because what contact could good have with evil? And so there is a downward path of creation. Uh, some of the philosophers made it look like a fountain, an infinite number of fountains from the perfectly good down through a series of emanations from God until you finally get down to the material world, which is almost all evil. Uh, and uh, uh, the, uh, the Gnostics actually believed that Jesus was uh, one of those emanations most of the way down. He was mostly evil with just a little bit of good, and so he could create the universe. Uh, it's a really, really bad idea. It's a very damaging idea. And among other things, it meant that for the followers of Greek philosophy, it was very difficult to think of a God-man. How could Jesus be both God and man, because God is spiritual, man is material, God is good, men are evil, uh, ideas are good, material things are bad. Uh, and the idea of a crucified and resurrected God was very difficult for uh, Greek philosophy. This stuff, this, this chart, gives you just a little bit to work on. The one word to, to remember is the dualism. The world is consisted of two parts, an upper and a lower, with a spiritual and a material, spiritual good, material bad. Uh, that idea actually continued well into the Middle Ages. Uh, and uh, we find the uh, the notion of uh, the, the asceticism of the monasteries in this dualism. Because by the, by the third, fourth, or fifth centuries AD, everybody knew that this chart is completely true. So Gnosticism in some important ways won this battle. Uh, what 
what Paul is arguing against is actually still a, um, a current misunderstanding of reality. Okay, so the Gnostics emphasized Plato's dualism. They're, they had ideas of uh, elite secret knowledge, which they called the mysteries. They added asceticism, which is a kind of bodily discipline like being monks. Uh, and uh, somewhere along the way, they added angels. Uh, nobody is entirely sure where the angels come in to the Colossian heresy. Uh, but uh, uh, we do find them. What is asceticism? asceticism is a Greek word, eskesis, which means bodily discipline or training. Uh, and it comes to mean the mistreatment of the body by uh, not getting married, by not having fun, by not eating nice food, by not sleeping on a comfortable bed uh, so that you will de-emphasize your material needs and become a more spiritual person, if that's helpful. Okay, that was, that was Donna asking me, what is asceticism? Uh, think of uh, what the monks did during the Middle Ages. And that, that's, the, that's the same direction. Okay. Uh, legalism is uh, a, an interesting thing. Let's see here. Uh, you who were do, 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 very powerful work of God raised him from the dead. Yeah, the resurrection is a problem for the Gnostics. But verse 13, and you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven all of our trespasses. And then drop down to verse 16. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food or drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. Okay, what's he saying here? Uh, he's saying you were dead and God made you alive. That's a big deal. Uh, the, uh, we, we go back to dead Fred in Romans. Uh, salvation is not the adoption of a new set of rules or a new set of rituals or a better haircut or a, a different kind of clothing. Uh, salvation is life from the dead. We have been raised together with Christ, made alive with him, and he has forgiven all our trespasses, and now we are alive in Christ. So let no one pass judgment on you in questions of all this other stuff, food and drink and festivals and new moons and Sabbath, be gone, all of them, because none of that is of any value in salvation. Now, there are two kinds of legalism, what I call salvational and what I call sanctificational. The salvational legalism says, I must do good works <clears throat> with my food and drink and festivals, and new moons and Sabbaths and whatnot in order to be saved. I've got to do this in order to be saved. And so a list of works, a list of rules is necessary in order to get to the zero point. And Paul has already made it clear. You are alive with Christ. So walk in that new life. You don't need to get up to the zero point. And good works won't do that. Paul makes that really clear in Romans and Galatians and Ephesians. And here in Colossians, he's building on that. <clears throat> Sanctificational legalism is the idea that following a list of rules can make me a, a better Christian. I, I will be stronger as a Christian by uh, blindly following a list of rules. 
Uh, this is a little harder to argue uh, because uh, for some young Christians uh, just starting out, uh, it actually can be helpful to give them some rules uh, and to, uh, uh, to give them some, uh, some accountability. It depends on what they're struggling with and uh, oh, what kind of help they need. Uh, it, but if, a, uh, uh, if a, a, a youngster comes to me and says, I'm struggling with this, well, I, okay, here, you can, do, you can try this. Let's, uh, let's say you, you absolutely can't go to the taverns at all. You just can't do that. Uh, and I'm going to ask you every time I see you how you're doing on visiting taverns. Uh, and uh, you need to tell me honestly. <laughs> that only needs to be done as long as it takes to build a habit. It takes a couple of months to build a habit. Uh, and they can get through that. The goal in the growing Christian life is for me to do the right thing because I love God and want to please him. Not because I've got a list of rules and my discipler is going to beat up on me. Uh, now, that may be necessary at, in the beginning, but we get rid of that as quickly as possible. Uh, when I was going through Romans, I talked about weak and strong faith. Uh, the one who is strong in faith can stand up on his own, and he chooses to do the right thing because it's the right thing to do, and that's what he wants. The one who is weak in faith is like wet concrete. He hasn't set up yet. He still needs some forms around the outside. Uh, so when we lead somebody to Christ, we often have to build some forms so that the concrete can set up, and so that the steel can take over the support of the whole structure. That's what that's for. Uh, Paul says, don't let anybody pass judgment on you and all this stuff. Your legalism is not helpful. Uh, both salvational and sanctificational legalism are wrong-headed. They're not taking you in the right direction. Uh, Paul is next going to go on to the problem of mysticism. Mysticism is a, is a constant in the church. There has always been an element of mysticism, uh, and it goes all the way back into the Old Testament. Mysticism is the idea that I can have a direct pipeline to God that I don't, I don't really need the scripture. I don't even need words in my prayers. I can have a direct pipeline to God. Uh, this, uh, this photograph is a, a statue uh, in France of uh, Teresa of Avila. That's the, the nun on the right is Teresa of Avila. And the, uh, the character on the left is an angel with an arrow. And this angel is just stabbing Teresa of Avila. And uh, uh, she's in uh, ecstasies of mysticism. I just uh, en enjoying being stabbed by this arrow. And I've never entirely understood that. She's going, ooh, 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 stab me again. You know, I, I don't get it. I honestly don't. Uh, but Teresa of Avila is uh, one of the uh, most famous of the medieval mystics. And she had dreams and visions and all kinds of fabulous out-of-body experiences. And she writes about them uh, in uh, so-called mystical classics. Uh, I, don't, I don't care much uh, for that stuff, uh, but many, many people do, including many Christians. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and the worship of angels or going on in detail about visions puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind. Uh, it's, a, it's an interesting thing. We wonder what all they were, were doing. Um, verse 19 is one that I probably should have included here and not holding fast to the head 
from whom the whole body nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments grows with a growth that is from God. If, if our headship is in Christ and the whole body is growing together, then I as an individual ought to be receiving my nourishment through the whole body. Uh, it's, it's not my individual personal direct pipeline to God that is making me powerful. Uh, it is the, the relationship to the body of Christ, the larger church, uh, uh, and the head of the church is Christ. So the asceticism doesn't get us there. The worship of angels doesn't do the job. Dreams and visions of all sorts uh, are not usually helpful. Now, I'm not going to argue that uh, the discipline is unnecessary, that angels don't exist, uh, that we once in a while are likely to run into angels, uh, or that uh, visions can't ever happen. Uh, it's that an emphasis in life uh, on uh, my own personal discipline, my own personal angel, my own personal visions and dreams uh, it tends to be unhealthy. Uh, doesn't usually lead in very good directions. Uh, in uh, verse 20, yeah. Uh, Here's what's wrong with asceticism. And for a background, I've got a, a cloister in France. Uh, asceticism is wrong. Immunity is in Christ. Immunity to what? Let's think about it. If with Christ you died, there he goes again. In Christ, when we were made alive, when we were born again, we also died. There's something going on here. You died to the elemental spirits of the world. Here's that notion again. This, the, the philosophical presuppositions of the world. Uh, the ideas of uh, Plato and Aristotle and the others that are contrary to scripture. If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why? as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, referring to the things that perish as they are used, according to human precepts and teachings. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. Okay. The, in the Greek world at this time, uh, the, the, there, were, there, there were two sides of, uh, of, of the coin. There was one group of philosophers who believed that you ought to eat, drink, and be merry. We called these folks the hedonists. Uh, and they believed that the purpose of life was to enjoy everything. Uh, and uh, uh, enjoy the, as, as much as you possibly can manage. Uh, there was a, another group of philosophers who said, well, yes, the purpose of life is to enjoy life, uh, but in moderation, you know, don't, over, don't overdo it. We call these folks the Epicureans. Uh, and they said, uh, food is great, but don't overeat. And food is great, but really good food is better than mediocre food. So go after healthy, good, really nice food instead of uh, uh, fast food and cheap food. <laughs> okay, well, that's okay. That's of some value, but not much. Uh, they have an appearance of wisdom, uh, but it, it really isn't the main thing. Why do you submit to the regulations? Don't handle, don't taste, don't touch things that perish, according to human precepts. Uh, they're of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. What has value? Being alive in Christ. Uh, so uh, asceticism says that uh, there's discipline in all the, spirit, uh, all the physical things 
is the path to salvation. Uh, and uh, there are still people who believe that, you know, by doing this good works and by denying myself of everything that I want, uh, I'm on the road to salvation. The bottom line is that we are not in that world. We are alive in Christ. Uh, the immunity to all of this, the immunity to the uh, indulgence of the flesh is found in our growing relationship to Christ. Uh, again, this downward path of uh, creation, upward path of salvation that we find in Plato. Uh, the third general section of the book is in chapter three, and I'm going to go quickly, I think. Beginning of verse one, uh, Paul says, we ought to be seeking what is above. If then you have been raised with Christ, and you have, that's important to understand. If then you have been raised with Christ, and of course you have, you're born again, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died. Golly, that's an important concept. You have died at the moment of regeneration, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. The part of me that lives forever is hidden in Christ, in God. When Christ, who is your life, I'm emphasizing that because it's so important. Christ, who is your life, appears. Then you also will appear with him in glory. Christianity is all about the new life. And that new life is essentially spiritual. It is eternal. It is invisible. It is designed for heaven. We feel uncomfortable in this world, or at least we should, because we no longer fit here. We're not a very good part of this world. We're left here to be a witness to those who are around us uh, while we're waiting for heaven. So what should we do about that? Put to death that for, uh, therefore, what is earthly in you? Sexual immorality and impurity and passion and evil desire and covetousness, which is idolatry. Interesting statement there, covetousness which is idolatry. Uh, if you uh, pay any attention at all to advertising uh, on uh, billboards or TV or on the internet, I ignore the ads on the internet uh, and, and never click on those. I should in the, the sites that I, I think are worthwhile, uh, but I just hate those things. Uh, <laughs> because, uh, uh, what, what, what the advertising does is try to get you to covet something. Uh, here's something that you don't have and you really need. You need it really, really bad. You need it worse than you need anything else. And so you should sell everything that you have and come buy this. Uh, or go into debt, get out your credit card and buy this thing. Um, that's not good. That's not healthy. Uh, and in fact, it can amount to idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. <coughs> Uh, these uh, these two statues are uh, uh, are in uh, uh, a um, <coughs> in a French cathedral called Saint Denis in uh, the north part of Paris, uh, and I kind of like uh, the guy on the left. Uh, I'm not sure who the lady on the right is, but that, I like the guy on the left. Uh, he's just he's trying to uh, put to death what is earthly and keep his mind on things above. Um, I don't know. I, I kind of like that. Okay. Uh, Paul goes on. Uh, 
in the whole next uh, section is uh, as we get into uh, verse, uh, verse 12 uh, and uh, beyond, uh, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you. Uh, uh, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Great passage, very encouraging. And Paul continues uh, in uh, verse 16, which is the parallel of uh, Ephesians chapter 5. Remember, do not be drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Okay, in Colossians, instead of be filled with the Spirit, Paul says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Well, how do I know that that's the same thing? I know that that's the same thing because I look at what's happening afterwards. Uh, Paul uses almost exactly the same language as he used in Ephesians teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God our Father through him. It's almost identical language to what he had just said in the book of Ephesians. And he wrote both of these books at about the same time. So I, he was thinking the same thing. So what he means by be filled with the Spirit is parallel to let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. How do you become full of the spirit? Well, some people say, oh, well, you got to start talking in tongues. Um, I disagree. I think the Bible interprets the Bible. And here, uh, Paul very clearly says, you can be full of the Spirit of God by letting the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. And then once you are full of the Spirit and full of the Word of God, teach and admonish one another with wisdom. Sing and pray and be thankful in heart and whatever you do, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Ah, so we have this community of faith, uh, men and women and children who, because the word of Christ dwells in them richly, they are full of the Spirit, they are under the control of the Spirit of God, and they are able to interact with one another, to build one another up in the name of Christ. I think this is a beautiful picture of what the church ought to be. Paul is going to go on, verse 18. Uh, some of the, uh, this continues the parallel with uh, Ephesians. The Ephesians passage is a little longer, uh, but it's, uh, it's essentially the same idea. It's uh, uh, our private lives, our, our relationship of wives and husbands, fathers and children, servants and masters, and we're seeing the same thing here as in Ephesians, only more briefly. Wives, submit to your uh, husbands. Husbands, love your wives. Children, obey your parents. Fathers, don't provoke your children. Bond servants, obey. Uh, and whatever you do, verse 23, do heartily as for the Lord and not for men. When we work for a living, which all of us ought to do. Uh, uh, you know, I've had jobs in my life that I didn't like. Uh, I can think of several examples. Uh, and, uh, I always did those as to the Lord. Uh, you know, I've, I've got to work for a living, and it's not everything that I do is fun. <laughs> And I don't get to call my time my own. It belongs to the one that I'm, I'm serving at the moment. 
I, and uh, so I, I do the job because God has called me to support my family. I, and I do the work as though I'm working for Christ, uh, not for that, uh, that boss of mine, uh, whom I may not uh, entirely appreciate. Sometimes I do. I, I like working for nice people, but that doesn't always help. And uh, Paul goes on uh, in uh, verse, uh, verse 2 of chapter 4. Continue praying steadfastly. And here I've got a couple of baby angels. Uh, uh, these, uh, these baby angels are somewhere in France. I've forgotten where. Uh, and by the way, there aren't any baby angels. Uh, the, uh, uh, the angels are all full grown. Uh, and they uh, particularly normally don't have wings, uh, but we we have uh, baby angels with wings uh, in in churches all over the place. Don't ask me why. Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. Okay, so uh, being watchful. Why are we watchful as we pray? As we're calling on God to do a mighty work somewhere, uh, we should be watchful so that when it happens, we can say thanks for that. Uh, you know, be watchful with thanksgiving. If you pray, uh, anticipate God's answers and uh, be watching out for those answers because they come. Uh, I'm. Uh, I, I used to be astounded when God would answer prayer. I, and I had a pastor once who said, but didn't you ask him for something? Why is it so surprising that God would answer prayer? <laughs> you know, I guess it just is. Uh, at the same time, pray also for us, that God may open to us a door for the word, to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear just how I ought to speak. I like Paul. And, uh, here he is in prison. He's saying uh, it, it, it's more difficult than it ought to be to do evangelism. Uh, so pray that God might open a door for us. Uh, he was always looking for doors to walk through, beginning at verse 5. Walk in wisdom toward those on the outside, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. That's just good, uh, good advice. And uh, verse, uh, verse 7 uh, through 17, some uh, practical stuff he's going to sell uh, Tychicus will let you in on what's going on uh, and uh, Aristarchus says hi uh, and uh, Onesimus is um, uh, coming along by the way we're going to run into Onesimus uh, a little later he's the uh, the escaped slave uh, who is uh, going to feature in the, uh, the little book of Philemon which is such fun uh, and uh, uh, Philemon was probably in the church in uh, uh, Colossae. Uh, so that letter is long too. And uh, Epaphras uh, uh, is uh, the messenger who is carrying the letter. Uh, and uh, uh, Paul encourages the church to support uh, Epaphras, who is a good pastor to that church. Uh, and uh, Luke says, hi, give my greetings to the brothers at Laodicea, also to Nympha and the church in her house. And when this letter has been read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans and see that you also read the letter from Laodicea. So there's letters going back and forth and say to Archippus, see that you fulfill the ministry that you have received in the Lord, whatever that might have been. These personal notes uh, demonstrate Paul's interaction with the church there in Colossae and Laodicea. He's doing the best he can from prison. Uh, and uh, you, you might say he's even 
going out of his way to be interfering with things, but he's not. He, he, he cares about these people and he loves them. Then Paul goes on into verse 18 and finishes up the book. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. There he is, grace all over again. Uh, and that's the, that's the book to the Colossians. There's some, uh, there's some great stuff in that little book. Uh, Paul is essentially encouraging a, a pretty good church to be careful about the, the philosophy that is bumping into them from the broader world. That is still a good admonition for us today. The wider world would love to stuff us into its mold. The world would like us to think like they do. Uh, and they think that uh, all of the bad things that have happened in, the, in their world are not the fault of their bad philosophy. And that we ought to adopt their bad philosophy so that the same bad things that they are experiencing can happen to us. Uh, we have the right to tell them no. Uh, there, there are some places they can put their ideas that have nothing to do with us. Uh, and God bless you. Good luck with those bad ideas. We don't want them. Uh, and there are lots of those out in the world. Uh, and uh, we are not required to support those at all. Uh, let it go. Let it go. Okay, I'm going to uh, I'm going to unmute us all. We're going to come back on uh, what what is today? Today is uh, Monday, and on Wednesday uh, we will do the uh, the book of First Thessalonians. Thessalonians. At least we will get a real good start on First Thessalonians. <laughs> the the Thessalonian epistles are are, are are fascinating. They're difficult in some ways. Uh, and, uh, the emphasis in the Thessalonians is on uh, uh, the second coming of Christ and the uh, rapture and all of, all of that. Uh, and a lot of that isn't terribly practical. But we'll look uh, we'll look briefly through the Thessalonians. There's some parts of it that uh, really are pretty practical, and I, I I like the way Paul is handling the church in Thessalonica. So God bless you all. Uh, Donna and I say hi and bye, and thumbs up Thank to you, you, Don. Thank you. Yeah, and Thank lovey, you. good to see you. Hey, Mark. Thank you, Dr. John. Yeah, thanks for sharing your daughter with us. Hey, uh, Eduardo, I see you there. Bye-bye. Thank you, Dr. John. Bye-bye, Mr. Joel. Bye, bye Christine. Bye, 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 everybody. Okay, yeah, I see the Lee family. Thank you, Dr. John. Anyway, hey, Willie, uh, good, good to see you, my friend. Oscar, brother, how are you? <laughs> Yeah, thumbs up. All right. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see you all on Wednesday. Wednesday. Bless you all. Have a good week. Okay. Uh, uh, our snow is all gone, so we're all happy and the horse is happy. God bless. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, Don.